Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath to all of you. It's good to see you all here this morning. As you look outside, it is a little bit gloomy, isn't it? We're waiting for the sun to come back out, but uh, the sun of righteousness, however, is always out. Amen. Jesus is always there for us. So I'm so glad to see all of you here. We want to thank all of our participants this morning for uh, sharing your talent and for participating. We also want to uh, thank the music, the special music as well. And um, I want to welcome some of you who uh, probably seen you here for the first time. Uh, we want to uh, want to tell you welcome and glad you're here for our guests. We want to remind you that we do have a lunch right after the service okay so we will have a potluck downstairs and also um it's uh, it's my uh all right so right after our potluck from three to seven just want to remind you it was announced earlier but for those of you who came in a little bit later i want to remind you that we do have a prayer vigil at three to seven. Um, we know that uh, a church that pray is a church that love one another and uh, grow. And so we want to invite you a uh, little on three to seven. So you don't have to actually go home. We do have lunch here. And so that we could come. Now, it was announced that if you can't stay for the whole four hours, you can stay for an hour at a time. So um, you know, we want to give you that freedom as well, but we would love to have you any of the time. Three to four, four to five, five to six, and uh, six to seven. That would be uh, wonderful. And so please stay with us and as we pray together. Um, we are continuing in our series about ma money matters. We are talking about stewardship. And um, some people don't like to talk about money or personal finance because they said that's why it's called personal finance. But what's amazing is that the Bible tells us there's a lot more verses in the Bible that talks about finance than any other topic. And so that is why we talk about it. And you say, well, Pastor, today is a Sabbath. Why do we talk about finance? Well, friend, Jesus talked about finance all the time, right? Um, Jesus spoke in, in, his, in his three and a half years of ministry, Jesus spoke about wealth, finance, and how this relates to a person's life um, all the time. In fact, he talked more about it than any other uh, topics. And so that's, what we're, that's why we're continuing in our series, uh, Stewardship. Relation, stewardship is relationship. Um, today's topic, we're going to be going over Biblical Finance 101, and we are talking about part two because uh, last time we only ended up going to four points, and so today we are following up with the rest of the points as well. And so I hope you have come prepared and ready to learn and to be better steward, to be faithful followers of Jesus. Remember, friends, that our handling of of finance is proportionate to how we receive grace. Meaning the way we understand how we should be stewards is the way we understand how grace works. And so that is why uh, it's important for us to talk about this. And so today that's what we're gonna be going over. I wanna ask you to pray with me as we um, dive down into this topic. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your grace. And your mercy, you have brought us here together again. And Lord, as we open your word and as we go through scripture, the passages about finance, we pray, Lord, that you would please teach us, help us to be better and faithful follower of Jesus Christ. May you challenge us. May we come up higher in the way we live our lives. And Father, as for me, I pray to you, please, Hide me behind a cross. I pray that Jesus would be uplifted 
and that we would be drawn to him. This is my humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> a young man went to church and made a covenant with a pastor to tithe 10% of their income every year. He was young and, you know, he had neither money and neither had experience, but that was about to change for him because he came and made a commitment to the pastor and to the Lord. The layman tithed a thousand dollar the year he earned ten thousand and he earned the next year he earned a hundred thousand so he tied a hundred uh, ten thousand the following year he tied a hundred thousand and on and on and on finally on the year that he made six million dollars he just could not bring himself to write out a check for $600,000. So he called the pastor and, uh, you know, he had moved to another location. And so he did call the pastor and he said, I want to come in and, and, and talk to you uh, about this tithing thing. And so he finally came into the ch same church and talked to the same pastor. He said, this tithing business has got to stop. It was fine when it was just a thousand dollar. I just cannot afford six hundred thousand to return to the church. And he said, Pastor, you got to do something about this. And so the pastor, being wise, he started kneeling down and he started to pray silently eventually the man was so curious and and impatient and and said pastor what are you doing are you praying that god would let me off the covenant of tithe the pastor stood up and said no i am praying for god to reduce your income back to a level where you can tithe a thousand dollar a year There's a lot of truth to that. Amen. When it comes to small amounts, sometimes we don't think about it. But when it comes to big amount, we think that we own it. And so now we don't want to or we are unwilling to. But there's a huge problem there. It's because we don't understand that we are not the owner of our resources. The man thought that he made so much money and so it's his. But at the end of the day, friend, nothing belongs to us. Have you ever realized that? You know, when you leave this world, you bring nothing with you. You don't even bring a dime. Amen? When you are six feet below, you know that there is nothing that you can bring with you. And so it takes a lot of perspective to look at, at the right direction, to see the right way of what is God's plan when it comes to wealth and finance. Meaning if we think that we own resources, when we think that we own our wealth, when we think that we own everything that we have, then yes, of course, we think that giving, returning, and being generous is sometimes become a burden. But if we realize that we come into this world naked, right? And we go out, in, out of this world naked, then we realize that we don't, in between, we are simply stewards. We are simply managers of what God has entrusted us. Amen? So today we continue in our biblical steps to buy, uh, Biblical Finance 101. We have talked about uh, steps to financial freedom in the past, last, the past Sabbath, uh, four um, steps. But then today we're going to talk about four more. We, we deal with get to work and earn income. Remember that? Stay away from debt. I'm going to share with you a little bit of my own journey and how we are still paying off our student loan and how that is a burden because I didn't know about finance. And we talk about making a budget and stick to the budget. 
and then setting aside emergency fund. And so let's get to number five, and we will continue in our series because we are talking about finance. Number five in this series we're talking about is we need to live below our means. Amen? Live below our means. Dave Ramsey, you guys, if you ever heard or know who he is, he said, like, live like no one else, so later you can live like no one else. Have you guys ever heard of that? Anyone? All right. So this is their motto in their total money makeover. It's a way of reminding you that you got to make sacrifices today so that one day you can live like no one else. Amen. You see, friends, in America, the majority of Americans say that they spend beyond their means, meaning they live paycheck to paycheck. More than 60% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, meaning they have so much or they have so much expense or they spend so much and there's nothing left. This includes um, half of the American which earn $100,000 or more a year. So this doesn't just hit the poverty level, but this hits everybody. And 72% of Americans say that they are financially Secure. They aren't financially secure, and more than a quarter said they will likely never be financially secure. That's almost close to 100%. And there are a few factors that contribute to Americans struggling to live below their means. And here are a few of them. Number one, lifestyle creep. Meaning, the more you earn, the more people want to spend, right? And that is very true today. Spending more on housing, eating out more, upgrading, you know, getting more nicer things, upgrading your iPhone almost every time one comes out or Samsung. And people are basically living paycheck to paycheck because we're incurring debt and we're not really saving up. And of course, we can't blame the fact that the cost of living is really incurring some people debt as well, um, especially here in the West Coast, right? Incomes have not kept up with inflation. In fact, in the past two years, the inflation is so much higher and they're trying to increase salary, but it's not keeping up with inflation. The $100 today, next year, is gonna be minus about $5. And so that's only worth $95 or uh, $92 or so because it will minus every year. And so, um, everything has gone up and salary has not kept up with the cost of living. That's very true, isn't it? And number three, why people are in so much debt is because of social pressure. Social pressure can be a common cause of overspending. The people you hang out with and you look at them, they have nicer car and, and they have branded clothes and so you want the same thing. And so you would spend and spend and spend. And so when people fail, they, they are pressured to spend uh, in a certain way to fit in in a social circle to avoid missing out on an experience. This is one pitfalls of financial hardship in America. And so uh, many people, because of uh, uh, social pressure, they would rather order food, right? Studies show that a lot of people are ordering food. This is why a lot of Fast food restaurants are, are, are thriving. And so you're ordering takeout and you're buying new clothes for a theme party. What's, what's, what's another uh, celebration that's coming up in America? Halloween. So you got to decorate your house, right? You got to put those costume and, and whatnot and that costs money. This is why uh, Christmas, uh, um, Thanksgiving, Halloween are billion dollar industry because they take your money buying some custom, right? And so uh, they're buying tickets to the concert because everybody is going. And so you got to follow the Joneses, right? And of course, using student loan, and this is basically, I've shared with you our testimony a little bit that we didn't know any about finance. And so we fall into that pitfalls as well. Um, but thank God that I'm learning and we've been learning and we have a, a three-year plan for how to pay off student loan. Number four, 
emotional impulse spending, meaning you can't control your own emotion. You, you watch an advertisement, and I, I got to get it. A right? few weeks later, you have it in, the, in, your, in your kitchen or living room or in room, and it just sits there collecting dust. And you wonder why, right? Because you were so impressed when you watched the commercial. Um, you're spending, you're, you spend money in response to an emotional trigger without considering whether it is a good idea or useful or practical, right? And so it can, it can include impulsive purchases, overspending, and you're feeling like dissatisfied and unhappy with life. And friend, that is the biggest factor. If you're not happy with who you are, you want to buy more things so you could decorate yourself, right? You want to buy more things so you could decorate your house, thinking that that would bring you some kind of self-worth or some kind of happiness. But friend, nothing brings true happiness. Not an external. Happiness does not come from external stuff. It must come from an internal relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? You are not thinking right. You let your emotion and impulse dictate the way you live your life. So friend, just because someone has a nicer car than you, who cares? Right? At the end of the day, yeah, you, it looks nice when you go in a stop sign, right? And people are looking at your car. Wow, they're impressed for a second. But guess who's paying for that? Right? They're not. Amen? You are. And too often, we incur debt as a result. And number five, was there, why so much debt is because of credit misconception. We talked about this last in our previous topic, right? Um, people say that in order for you to have a good credit, you need to get into debt. So we have so many credit cards, right? We have mortgages, we have loans, and we have personal loans. We have all kinds of credit card debt. And so as a result, we misunderstood because we talk about how, how FICO, right? Remember last time? We talked about how FICO is not about helping you to be financially independent. Everything about FICO, right, was about what? Debt. The more debt you have and you're paying it like monthly, the more better your score becomes, right? And if you have higher debt, they give you more. If you have higher score, they give you, you can borrow more money. And so that is basically a misconception about credit score. And so we mentioned that in our last topic. So credit score, by the way, was created by the bank to get you borrow more money and get you more in debt, right? When you go to this bank or those big corporation office, guess what? Their furniture is so much nicer than yours. Amen? You know why? Because you're paying for it in the form of debt and interest every single month. And so it's sad to say, but the Bible tells us, friends, 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. The Bible says, but godliness with what? Contentment is great gain. What does that mean? Meaning we need to learn to be content with what we have and what we don't have. Okay? Think and appreciate what you have and don't worry about what you don't have. Contentment doesn't come from a lot of stuff. And this is where we'll, you're, if you have a lot of low self-esteem, we think that when we have more things, we will be happier. But it is not true. It should come from having a great relationship with God and a family that loves you and a spouse and children and you have family that around you that you love. That should come, that should be your happiness. Amen? Your family that's around you. If you know the Lord, you should be the happiest person on earth. Now, I'm going to share with you a secret. You might say, well, Pastor, your suit is nice. You know how long I had this suit? 10 to 15 years. Most of my suit is that, that long. My wife's laughing because I know. I haven't bought suit in the past 10, 15 years, right? The Lord keeps it good somehow, amen? <laughs> and so, uh, um, yeah, I have, I have it. Most of my suit were gift to me, and so the Lord provide, amen? And, 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 you know, you don't have to buy branded clothes. In fact, you can go to, you want to buy a branded clothes, they have some uh, thrift store in the area. 
They have nice branded clothes. You can pay for a couple of dollars. And don't be ashamed. Hey, you know, my wife used to tell me, well, don't be telling everybody, you know, that we go to this store. Hey. Right? Come on now. Remember, happiness does not come from branded clothes. Amen? Happiness comes from knowing that I love my wife and she loved me. We love the Lord. And we are serving Jesus. Amen? And that should be our true worth. Amen? You can be, you can be driving a beat-up car. But because you have Jesus, you're the happiest driver, right? But you can be driving the most expensive car, but you don't have Jesus. You're hunking at everybody. Amen? And so it doesn't matter what you're wearing, what brand it is. If you are in Christ Jesus, you should learn to be content. Amen? Don't impress people that you don't know. Don't impress people that they don't even care what you're wearing. Amen? Don't buy a car or a house or clothes or fashion to impress someone else. No one cares what kind of car you drive. Amen? Be happy with what you have. Because if you think that you're going to be happy with a newer car, guess what? It gets old too. Amen? And now the next time you're going to want something else. It's a never-ending want. The drive the car that good mileage amen and affordable that lasts you long i know people love tesla and it, it's, it's a nice car i i like the car too but is it is not for me it's not in my pocket budget amen i'm good with five to ten thousand dollar car hey it drives well it gets me from point a to point b and i'm happy got no payment right it, it's it's better that way and so let's learn to live better don't be uh, following what everybody else is doing. It does not matter. Amen? You don't have to wear branded uh, clothes to live a good life. You can be truly happy with just any brand. Amen? You can. Don't spend money that you don't have and don't borrow from your future. That's a good principle to live by. Don't spend money that you don't have and don't borrow from your future. America is really good at that, right? We're borrowing from the future of our children, right? Live, living below your mean doesn't mean that you are broke. Are you guys following? Living below your mean doesn't mean you're broke, but you found your contentment in the simplicity of life. That, my friend, is the true happiness. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. The Bible tells us, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be what? To be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. In fact, Paul is telling us, whatever situation you might be right now, be happy and thank God for it. Oh, pastor, I live in one bedroom apartment and I don't have much stuff. So what? Do anybody care? Oh, you can live a happy life in a single bedroom. Amen? In fact, if you're not happy in a single bedroom, you will not be happy with a mansion. Because stuff does not bring true happiness. Amen? And as a young person, if you learn this while you're young, you're not going to be seeking some dangerous things in life. You will learn to be content with just what you have. Amen? And when you do that, you are blessed. You're blessed above all people. It doesn't mean you will have everything, but that you actually do have everything. How? Because happiness does not come from stuff. It comes from a great relationship and a beautiful Savior who loved you and he gave himself for you. So the next time you're tempted to live above your means, think about what you already have. Thank God for a warm house. Thank God for food in a table, a bed to sleep, amen, a roof over your head. Thank God for that. And when you learn to be thankful with what you have, you will learn. To live a great life and young people you need to learn from from your family from your parents 
A lot of our, our, our church members in this church have come from other countries, and sometimes we understand how hard life could be, right? And we got to teach our kids, don't, 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 don't spoil them, thinking that, oh, I don't want my kids to work because they're going to school. No, 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 no. That's actually, you're not teaching them how to be responsible. What happens when you pass away, right? What happens when you're gone? How are, you, how are they going to live? Right? Because we got to train them how to work. Work is actually good for the human system. Amen? It's good. Even in the perfect world, Adam and Eve were given a job in the Garden of Eden in a perfect world. And so learn to teach them how to work. Amen? All right. <clears throat> the next point that we're going to be going over is called number six, start investing and build wealth. Start investing and build wealth. Investing is very important. The Bible has so much to say about this. In fact, it has so much to say about this that we're going to deal with this specific point in our next topic. Okay? A whole topic just on start investing. And so if you don't know how, there are many educational videos out there. We all need to start somewhere. And if you want to talk more about this topic, you can, you know, you can approach me. I'm not a financial advisor, but... I can share with you what I learned, and we can share with each other what we have learned so that we can become better stewards for the kingdom of heaven. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 11. The Bible says, wealth gain, what's the word? Hastily will what? Dwindle. Meaning, you bought a, a lottery ticket, and uh, you won. The text says, gain hastily will what? It will dwindle. But whoever gathers little by what? Little will increase it. And so this is an interesting Bible text. We're, we're going to deal with that more deeper later on. Investing isn't a get quick, you know, rich quick scheme, right? It takes years and patience. You need to learn how to diversify, right? And you need to invest responsibly. So again, like I said, we're going to deal with this topic specifically just for this point in the next topic. The Bible tells in Luke chapter 19 and verse 13, this is what our, our scripture reading earlier. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 menas, and said to them, do business till I what? Till I come. In fact, this is what Jesus was talking about. Other translations said, put this money to work, he said, until I come back. And then in other translation, he said, invest this for while I am gone, or engage in business until I come back again. So that word, do business till I come, is a principle because there are some believers who think that when you are a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, you shouldn't be talking about investing. You shouldn't be talking about money and how you should be uh, prospering yourself. That is actually not biblical. Because when we talk about the Bible, the Bible talk so much about investing and finance. In fact, out of 11, uh, uh, out of the teachings of Jesus, he talks about roughly 15% about finances in his preaching. That's 11 out of 39 parables he talk about finance and how it deals with our relationship with God and one another and how we can become responsible human citizen and heavenly citizen. Amen? It was his most, one of his most talked about topic. So we're given more instruction in the Bible about money, wealth, possession, about 2,300 verses in the Bible, more than faith and prayer combined in all scripture. So if money and investing is not good, why, if it's not biblical, why does God talk about it so much, right? It's because he wants us to be faithful citizen of the kingdom. Because friends, when we get to heaven, it's not going to be, you're not going to have no responsibility. You will. God will entrust you with greater responsibility. That's what the Bible tells us. Those who are faithful in little things, they will be faithful in what? Greater things. And what is that greater thing when we get to heaven? And so, God is entrusting us how we can be faithful stewards here in, on earth. Instead of going out all the time, make your own budget. Imagine 
if you save more money and invest rather than simply going out all the time. And friends, um, plan your, 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 your monthly expenses, okay? Plan your meals at home. In fact, home-cooked meals are the healthiest and cheaper. You know that, right? It is. You know, and um, my wife will start laughing and saying stuff again, but you know when you go out, um, we go out with just us, you spend a hundred dollar. That's to me. I feel like man. I just, I feel like I just giving up my, what is that? A couple of days of work, right? That could be my whole week of of of, of uh, a grocery, right? A hundred dollar for me is a one week, or a little bit less than one week. But that's a lot of money, right? You can plan your own meal at home, and it tastes better. It's healthier, and you save money. Friend, I'm not saying that you shouldn't go out, okay? Don't, don't get me wrong. You sh I didn't say that you shouldn't go out, but plan your going out and spend only what you plan on spending. Amen? Any extra you have left over that you didn't spend, if you, we talked about in our previous study, if you have a budget, if any money that you already have emergency fund, you paid all your monthly expenses, those money should be invested, okay? And so with emergency fund in place, put them in investing. Now again, next, next time we're gonna have a, a whole topic on, on the whole thing, okay? So I'm just scratching your back a little bit so that we can continue with the next point. But start investing because that is what actually what the Bible tells us. And the spirit of prophecy tells us about that in light of what that relationship is like with Christ. It's not to build wealth for yourself. It's to have so that you can become generous for the kingdom of heaven. Well, let me talk about this a little bit here before we go to our next But What about life insurance, right? What about life insurance? Is it okay to buy life insurance? Absolutely, yes. Do you love your family? Anybody? Do you love your family? If you love your family, if you do, be sure that when you are gone, they are taken care of. Amen? If you already have reasonable amount for investment that protects your family, you don't need, you don't need uh, life insurance. But if you don't, your family, when you pass away, should be just able to be able to be grieving instead of worrying what comes next. Amen? And so there's no... There's no need to get one if you already have enough to protect your family financially from financial hardship. But if you don't get one, if you don't have enough, I think it's best that you do plan that. Now, friends, um, if, you, if, if, if you listen to Dave Ramsey, right, they, they do have um, trusted life insurance and all that stuff. And so you can talk to me if you want to later on, but it's very important that we help protect our family, okay? And so I'm not going to talk much about that. I'm not a life insurance agent or anything, but it's important for us because it's to protect your family, right? Now, number seven, um, fund your retirement. This is why if you don't have retirement, it's good to have life insurance. In my culture, maybe in, in, in many of your culture as well, parents don't have retirement. How many of you can relate to that? No shame in that, okay? In my culture, Asian culture, we don't have, parents don't have insurance or, or, or life uh, uh, retirement. You know what our retirement is in our culture? Our kids, right? Maybe some of you too. Our retirement in our culture is our kids. The more kids you have, the more retirement you get. Yeah, I'm serious. It's not a joke. It's, it's, it's in my culture. And, and you laugh because you're probably in your culture, in your home. Even if you're American, you probably know that that is true in your household as well. Right? We, 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 are, we want our kids to provide for us. And there's nothing wrong with that because kids need to be taught to be giver. But it becomes such a burden for the children, the pressure that we put heavily on our young kids when they grow up 
Because we as parents don't have retirement. It becomes their burden financially. I don't think that that is right. I help my family, okay? We, we help our family. We're not like trying to keep, you know, we don't have much, but we help. But I think that we need to start learning to plan for retirement. Because that is how you actually do a favor to your children. The best thing you can do for your kids is to fund your retirement so that you're not a burden to them one day. Amen. Well, pastor, does the Bible talk about retirement? Right? Because we want to be biblical. We want to be, we want to see what the Bible actually say. Is retirement mentioned in the Bible? The short answer is no, but also yes. All right? The word itself does not tell us there, but the principle is there. What does that mean? All right? The Bible offers some guidance on how to live a life of faith and service even after a person stops working from their day job. The Bible tells us that. While it is acceptable to retire from one job, the Bible doesn't say to stop working entirely. Christians don't retire from serving God, amen? And others, but rather they change location. That's it. From one job, day job, to now you keep on, now you have more time to serve the Lord. They can continue to be active church members, good parents and faithful followers of Jesus. Retirement is not a biblical concept as far as you put so much money and now I don't have to work. That, that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that you have to be financially secure, but you are a follower of Jesus and you serve him faithfully. In all that you do. That, my friend, is a biblical retirement. So when, uh, in fact, retirement is a new, is a new cultural concept in, in, in this context, what we are learning. In the 21st century, American thinks of modern retirement, which is basically the word retirement, when we think about it, it's only invented in 1950s, right? Um, that the Bible doesn't specifically address that kind of retirement. However, depending on which translation you use, the word retire is actually mentioned in the Bible. I'll show you here. The book of Numbers chapter 8. Take note if you are. The Bible chapter, uh, Numbers chapter 8, verse 34 and 30, uh, 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 24, 25, and 26, it says, this is what uh, pertains to the Levites. From 25 years old and above, one may enter and perform service in the work of the tabernacle meeting. And at the age of what? 50 years, they must what? Cease from performing this work and shall work what? No more. So you guys are following here, right? A priest is basically employed in the temple. The Levite. They're employed in a temple at the age of what? 25. And they have all the way till when? Till 50 to be employed in the sanctuary. And after 50, they, what? They cease, no, they, they retire. But it does not mean that they are completely out of job. Doesn't mean that they are no longer working for the Lord. Because they do. Notice what the next verse said. They may minister with their what? Brethren. So at 50, they're done. But what happened? They can still what? Minister with their brethren in the tabernacle of meeting to attend to the needs, but they themselves shall do no work, meaning official work as far as what the priest is doing. Thus you shall do the Levites regarding their duties. In other words, at a time when you retire, it doesn't mean that you are completely out of service for God. It simply means that you're no, you're no longer an official priest, but now you are an official and you are working in the side, training, helping the young ones. Teach them how to love Jesus and how to work with their hands for the kingdom. That's what they, the retired priest does. They're supposed to train those who are new. All right? And so from 25 to 50, they are now retired, but they do not cease from their work for the Lord. So how does this apply to you? 
Amen? How does it apply to you? They may not be employed officially, but they are still able to help. In fact, friends, I know that in the church sometimes we value a lot of our, our young people, but we need to value seniors in our churches that had so much knowledge and had so much experience that they can teach the young people. They have so much accumulated knowledge throughout the years that they have so much wisdom to help our younger generations. Retirement is a phase in life where you can use your gift and your skills and your ability to glorify God different than when you were working full time, an official day job. This does not mean that you shouldn't play golf or you shouldn't enjoy your retirement. That's not what it means. You can enjoy your retirement. You can enjoy your kids and grandkids and grandchildren. You can travel. However, if the focus of this stage in your life is you, simply all your comfort and all your enjoyment, then you are missing out on the joy of serving Jesus. Amen? As a Christian, you never truly retire. We adapt into a different type of ministry as we age, but... We are still serving Jesus. In fact, there was a story in the Bible. Oh, before that, let me, let me give you this. So should you put money on your retirement and how much? Absolutely, yes, you should. You should at least every month, right? Assuming that you already paid up all your debt, you know, you, you have your emergency fund, you should at least save 10 to 15 years, 15% uh, of your income every month. Okay, and you are putting that into your uh, retirement. Okay, um, 10 to 15 percent. Um, and how much should you have in your retirement to retire? Okay, statistic and study tells us that your retirement should be 25 times of what you spend a year, not what you make. Okay, are you guys following? If you make 100,000 but you only spend 50,000, that's for your total expenses. That's how much you should be times 25. Not the 100, but the 50. All right? If you do want to do your uh, a yearly uh, a gross average, then it has to be your yearly income times 12. All right? But which amount to actually your expense times 25 as well. And so this is very important because um, when you invest your money, it grows, right? The Bible has so much principle. We're going to go to that next time. But being a good steward of this phase of life in all areas, in our time and talent and treasure is important. And it doesn't happen without proper planning. Amen? It doesn't happen without proper training or planning. You have accumulated many gifts and skills and years of valuable experience that you can teach your kids, your young grandchildren to live a life for Jesus Christ. There are many people who think that now you are expired. You no longer uh, 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 should be able to work or should be able to influence people for the greater good. In fact, you have so much knowledge that God wants you to use it for the advancement of his kingdom. But there is, however, the negative side to Retirement. Notice what this text tells us. Luke chapter 12. It speaks of a man who wants to retire. Notice what it says. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what should I do? He had so much now. He basically saved up a lot, right? So what did he do? He said, I have no place to store my crops. So what happened? This is what I'm going to do. I will tear down my barn, which is small, Right? It doesn't fit all his things in there. And build what? Bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. Continue. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for how many? Many years. Take life what? Easy. Eat. What else? Drink. And be merry. But God said to him, what are you? You're a fool. Why? 
This very night, your life will be demanded from you. This is how it will be with whosoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward what? Toward God. So here what we find is a man who said, hey, I'm ready to retire. I've stored up a lot, but I don't have enough space. So I'm going to tear down this little tiny barn so I can build a bigger one so that I can enjoy life with ease for many, many years to come. I'm just going to eat. I'm just going to drink. I'm just going to be merry. I'm just going to live. I'm going to live life easily without caring for anything in the world. And what did Jesus say? Your life, you're a fool. Why? Yes, you retire. You can enjoy retirement. But he said, if that is all you plan for, you are a fool. Because when you retire, you have so much more time to do service for the kingdom of heaven. You can become a powerful disciple of Jesus, a trainer for the kingdom. So if you retire and you simply, hey, I've done my job. I've done my years of service. I'm good now. I can just sit down and do nothing else. The Bible said you are a fool. Your life is required of you. Why? At the last phrase, because he says that if they store up for themselves, they are rich. But what kind of riches is that? They are not rich toward what? Toward God. You know what that means? You may be wealthy. You may have a lot of retirement. But if you don't have an understanding of the character of God, Jesus, the Bible said, you're just a fool. Why? You might be wealthy in this world, but you are not rich towards who? Towards God. You have no understanding of your sense of responsibility that you are simply a manager. You are simply a steward of what God entrusted you. Even your retirement is what God entrusted you with. And what does God ask you? To be rich towards him. What does that mean? To understand your mission. To understand your purpose as a Christian, as a believer, as a Seventh-day Adventist living in the last day, you should understand your purpose. That, my friends, Jesus said, you should be rich towards God, not towards this, this world. He wanted to retire with life of pleasure and ease. And as a result, his life was cut short. This is what happens when you lose sight of your purpose as a believer in Jesus Christ. Christians, again, don't retire. They simply have shifted their priority now. They are more building the kingdom of heaven. Whereas before you're building some corporation, now you're building the kingdom of heaven. Even more. Amen? So friends, I challenge you. Well, pastor, I'm retired and I'm old now. Does God still want me? Friends, you already heard. Yes, you may be retired and you feel that God has no use for you. Let me remind you, there is no such thing. God has a spot and a purpose and a work for you. And for those of you who might feeling like, well, I'm old now. I have no use for society. That is not true. If you're a senior sitting here today or watching, listening, you have a purpose in God's cause. You always have a spot in the cause of God. Don't ever think that you are now past and beyond and society no longer appreciate you. That is not true. God wants you to work for him all the way. There are so many examples in the Bible of people. Enoch lived to be 365 years and the closer he was older, the more he was closer to God. Noah he obeyed God, and all the way, he lived to be 950 years, but he served God all the way, even after he built the ark. We don't have the record, but he does. He was faithful to God. When you read uh, Patriarch and Prophet and Prophets and Kings, Job, he lived to be 210 years old, and he was faithful even in his retirement age. God blessed him with double, right? He lost everything. But he's in, in his old age. God bless him more. And the more he was blessed, the more he was a blessing to the people around him. Abraham lived to be 175 years old. And he served God faithfully to the day he died. Joseph lived 110 years old. But he was faithful and he had unswerving faith 
and legacy that led the children of Israel later on to go back into the promised land, bringing his bone with them. Amen. Joshua lived to be 110 years old. And even in his retired age, even when Joshua was no longer in charge, he was still faithful in his retired age. Isaiah, Daniel, Simeon in the New Testament, and Anna, they were all retired A, but they served God in the temple day and night. Faithful. In fact, one of my favorite is John the Revelator. He was old, and he was sent into the Isle of Patmos as a captive for the as prisoner of Jesus Christ. But in there, in his retired aid, he should be enjoying his retirement. But friend, he was there, and he wrote the powerful book of the Bible, the book of Revelation in his old age. And he died praising God and serving God with all his life. Amen. You may be retired. You may be old. You may be wrinkly. But God still has a place for you in his work. Don't ever think that you are not important. You are. Amen. God has a place for you in his church and in his work. Society may not work, may not value you anymore, may not because you're no longer building their kingdom. But now you have more time to build the kingdom of God. That is why God placed so much more value in you, even though the world may no longer see you as a value to them. You're not forgotten. You're not an outcast. Your invaluable years of experience are needed now more than ever. You can serve God even in your old age. You are his champion in this last day. Amen. And the purpose of this all, number eight, this is our last point for today. With all of this investing, what is, what is the purpose of this? Is it to build my own kingdom and empire on earth? No, 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 no. God blesses us and he gives us wisdom so that we can build wealth, so that we can become outrageously generous. That is his main purpose. You are blessed so you can be a blessing. We've just completed the root of this church, right? The roof of this church. I want to thank you for your generous support. Our next project is the Fellowship Hall. We're planning to renovate it. We want to move the kitchen from one in the middle all the way to the side. And, and that, friend, does not happen without your participation. This is your church. This is your, your, your home. Amen? There's always going to be something that needs church help and repair. Again, God is asking his people to participate in his work. Amen. God is asking us to be generous because God blesses you with all of those points, all of those investing things. It's really to become financially free, but also to be generous. Because friend, none of those money, not even a dime, you'll take with you when you leave this world. Amen. And you know that the, the conference, they have trust funds, right? They do, they do have a trust services. Meaning if you have property, you have cash that's laying around, and when you pass away, the government might take it away. They have will that they could help you set that up. Amen. I'm not asking you because I'm, I'm, I'm paid by the conference. No, this has nothing to do with that. In fact, even if I'm not paid by them, I'd still be telling you the same thing. Um, amen. Because we know what it means to be faithful to the God that we serve. We are his faithful people in the last day. And friend, we know how important it is. How tithing is important. Remember that tithing isn't doing God a favor. We talked about this in our previous study, right? Is it, oh God, I'm, going, I'm, I'm giving you a favor, so I'm returning uh, tithe. No, 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 friend. You're doing yourself a favor. Because you're rooting out the pride and selfishness in your heart. It shows the reality of where your heart belongs. Amen? You know, the greatest investment is the investment for the kingdom of heaven. You know why? When you get there, guess what? You get free housing. Oh, come on now. When you get there, you get free food. Heaven is your greatest investment. Because heaven is eternity, 
why your little mansion here on earth will pass away. Right? You won't get to enjoy that. This is why heaven is your greatest investment. So think about it. You will spend 70, 80, some people live to be 100 years old here on earth. Okay, great, for, good for you. What happened next? Now you get to live eternity. But if you did not make an investment for your eternity, you're in trouble. Amen? Amen. You will spend eternity not in that kingdom, you know, you, you, you'll be gone. Right? So tithing isn't a favor you're doing for God. It's a recognition of God as your savior and your sustainer. You're simply returning what belongs to him because you are a steward of God's property. And if God could trust you with his little property here on earth, he could trust you with the new heaven and the new earth. Amen? That, my friend, is a greater responsibility that God wants us to be a part of. Oh, friends, tithing isn't doing God a favor. It's a recognition that you're saved by grace. It shows and affirm that you belong to Christ. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, as we bring this to close. So let each one give as he purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, but for God, for God loves a what? A cheerful giver. Not giving it because you have to. You give it because you love to. Amen? Because giving isn't about your pitying someone. Let me repeat that. Giving isn't about you pity somebody, so you're giving something. No, no, no. You are giving because you, deep down in your heart, that's what God wants you to do. And that's what you love to do. So when you give, give it from the heart and not from gaining some kind of praise. Proverbs eleven twenty five. the Bible said, the generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will be what? Themselves be what? Refresh. In other words, if you are generous, your generosity come back to you as well. Because when you water a plant, right, on the ground, guess what happened? They give you what? Fruit or vegetables in return, right? So your generosity in doing watering the plant, guess what? It comes back to your own mouth. And that is a cycle of faith and generosity. When you are faithful, God brings it back to you. Friend, let me tell you that you could never outgive God. Everything you give him one, he give you ten times more. That's what that's the God that we serve. God is a God who loves his people. The last text, the Bible said in Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give, and it will be. Come on, are you guys still awake? I know the food is waiting for us here. But this is my last text, come on. Give, and it will be what? Given to you, amen. You guys finally wake up. I know the food smells good, so okay. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you what? You use, it will be measured to you. It speaks of, in the Old Testament, this, this is passage. For us, yeah, it doesn't make sense. What does that mean? You're shaking it, you're measuring it, you're pressing it down. It's actually when someone, is, is they bring their basket or they bring their sock and then they put grain into it. They have to have good measurement to put it in there. But besides measuring, you have to shake it a little bit so that there's no air uh, leaking through it. And so there's no spot. <laughs> That's what the Bible text is telling us. And so the more you uh, pour grain into it, the more you have to shake it and you have to press it down so that there's no air into it. And then finally, it will be full. And what happened? It says run what? It runs over. And that is the blessing that God wants to bestow upon us. But it does not happen because we just put a little bit in there. Right? We say, oh, uh, 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 
what am I going to do if I, if I return my thigh? Oh, man, how, how am I going to survive? Friend, how are you going to survive if you don't? Because you could never, never, ever outgive God. He is the blesser of all. Jesus used this term because he wanted to communicate to us that the more you're giving, it will be measured back to you. Remember this as we close. Re your reception of God's blessing is a proportion to your generosity. Meaning if you give only a drop, Reluctantly, God says, okay, I'll give you a drop. But if you give God all, he will give you his all. Your view of God's grace will translate into your character, including being a giver and a generous person. It doesn't mean that every rich person is generous, but that your attitude changes when you are generous. You don't have to be rich to be generous. Giving is a trait of heaven. Because God is the most giving in the universe. The important thing to remember is that while God rewards our giving, it's not, it isn't mean to be our motivation because God is looking at the heart. Amen? God will always give. But how do we respond to his generosity? Friends, I hope that our response should be to live up the life of Christ in us, to be giver in the last day. So when you understand how much God has done for you, friend, you will become generous. God has given his all. He's asking us today to give him our heart, our all for him. Amen. How many of you want to be like Jesus today? He has given is all. And now he's asking us to give our all as well. Let's stand together as we sing this song, Give Thanks.